All right, I promise to go uh, right back to the telephones to someone who disagrees with me. And that means from Rochester, New Hampshire, Candy. Candy, you're on the G. Gordon Liddy Show. Hi, Gordon. How you doing? I'm doing splendidly so far, but uh, maybe after you have finished with me, I will not be doing splendidly. Fire away. Okay, well, um, I want you to consider four points and a conclusion that I've drawn or a question that comes out of them. And um, this is not intended as a uh, logical syllogism or anything, but just four points, and then I want to ask you a question, okay? I'm impressed just by the fact that you know what a logical syllogism is. Okay, well, number one, you preach and spread gun worship, including free and easy access for all. Number two, you preach and spread contempt for Bill Clinton and the desire to see him out of office. Number three, you vociferously and repeatedly say that Bill Clinton is a threat to the country. Four, among your listeners, there are no doubt many mentally unstable people. My question for you is to what extent do you see what you do um, connected to what happened last Saturday at the White House? All right. Well, I know you don't want to treat it as a logical syllogism, but first of all, uh, I have to deny your premise. I'm okay. treating it as a logical Which sentence. premise? All of them? Well, let, let's, let's take them uh, seriatim and in order. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't preach gun worship. One worships God. Any uh, Worship of anything else means uh, to put it in the place of God. And while I am an enthusiast of uh, firearms, I, I think uh, my enthusiasm hardly... Uh, rises to uh, the rank of worship. Well, we could change that to uh, that you're a gun enthusiast. And, yes, okay. You know, I mean, that doesn't... I'm, right. also, I'm also a constitution enthusiast, mm -hmm. and uh, what I preach is the Constitution of the United States, and I do not omit, uh, and I emphasize, uh, the Second Amendment. And that says simply that our right as... Uh, free human beings to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Do you think, well, this might get us a little bit off the topic, but do you think that if the founding fathers were alive today, they would be interpreting the Second Amendment in light of today's society the way you are? Well, they would have to if they were uh, the masters of the English language that they were. You see, what they said was this. They didn't, they did not, well, let's, let's go even further back. The Constitution itself mm -hmm. was drafted by uh, a group called the Federalists. Right. Now, there existed at the, uh, at the same time a group called the Anti-Federalists. And they were, uh, they were pretty strong politically back in those days. And they said, no, we're not going to ratify this Constitution. It will not fly the way it is because we don't believe it protects certain of our rights sufficiently. It's, it's too vague and ambiguous in that area. And so the Federalists said, well, all right, uh, why don't you draw up uh, specific language that will satisfy you on the rights that concern you? Okay. And so they drew up the first ten amendments, and the Anti-Federalists were the one who did it. And they were uh, masters of the English language, and You'll notice that it, uh, it, it addresses the, the militia, mm -hmm. which uh, contemporaneously at that time simply meant every uh, able-bodied uh, male and female in the land, a uh, male in the land. Now it would mean female also, I think we can all agree. And uh, said that in order that uh, they have such a thing, they would have to be armed. And it said the right of the people, and that's been held repeatedly in uh, all the other... Uh, uh, interpretations by the court of all the other uh, rights to be an individual right of individual people uh, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, what does that mean, shall not be infringed? It doesn't say uh, we give you the right. It says we recognize uh, that free human beings inherently have the God-given right uh, to keep and bear arms. And as yeah, a matter of fact... you can't literally interpret a document um, completely out of, a, out of an historical context. Well, wait a minute. I'm, I, haven't even, I haven't even finished interpreting yet, and you're already jumping on me. Now, th that was the situation back then. Now, if you want to go back even farther, uh, you know that uh, several years ago, they found up in the Italian Alps a perfectly preserved human body that was 5,000, two or 300 years old. Right. And it had state-of-the-art weaponry. He was a free man. He had uh, his bow, his arrows, his spear, and his knife. 
uh, which was you know the best they had at those days. And then thousands of years later, they invented the crossbow, and then they had you know gunpowder and all the rest all of right. it. Now, the uh, if you want to move forward yes, into the modern era, let's go to the last, the very last time the Supreme Court of the United States had occasion uh, to make a ruling on all of this. It was uh, United States versus Miller was the name of the case, and it was in the mid 1930s. Mr. Miller had been charged by the government with uh, possessing an illegal firearm, to wit, a shotgun, the barrel of which was too short, according to the law. There's a minimum. And uh, uh, Mr. Miller uh, didn't have a particularly good lawyer because the Supreme Court said Mr. Miller did not introduce evidence that would show that a short-barreled shotgun was useful militarily that it was a military weapon. Mm. Because had he done that, then he would have been completely protected by the Second Amendment because it includes military weapons. But, uh, of course, we know that uh, short barrel shotguns are regularly used by the military, but poor Mr. Miller's uh, lawyer didn't know that and well, didn't put it in there. Well, let's talk about Mr. Duran, though, for a minute. Well, let's talk about Mr. Duran. He, um, <clears throat> I, I, if I heard the news correctly, I think the situation was that he um, was dishonorably discharged from the military, is that right? After a conviction he, of a felony. Yeah, he had a record that was <clears throat> significant, yet he was freely able to acquire an automatic weapon. No, he didn't have an automatic weapon. What did he have? He had a semi-automatic Se weapon. Excuse me, semi-automatic weapon. Big difference. You know the difference? Well, I'm not exactly sure the difference, but I'm not well, sure I, well, I to no, I think, I, well, I think, well, no, I think it's important that the rest of the people listening to us know that the difference yes, we now. Should, we should definitely know. An automatic weapon is one in which uh, a single depression of the trigger, I squeeze the trigger back and just hold it there, and it will empty itself of every round of ammunition in a magazine. If it's got 30 rounds in the magazine, 30 rounds will come out, brrr, like that, machine gun. Semi-automatic. Every time I want to fire it, I have to uh, pull the trigger again. It will only fire okay. once. All right, what it, whichever type he had. He had a semi-automatic weapon. Okay. Um, and as I understand your views on these matters, um, it was perfectly fine and okay for this individual to have this. Well, wait a minute. If he was, in fact, a felon, and we understand now that he was, uh, he was Ill just as I would be. Mm -hmm. illegally in possession of a firearm because whether it's a, a an automatic weapon a semi-automatic weapon or a single shot weapon right. uh, for a felon a convicted felon to have it is against the law where did he get it i don't, I don't remember that piece do you remember here? i don't know where he obtained it but i would suggest he, that he, he, that he probably purchased it he probably I mean, purchased he, it i mean getting back to the second amendment for a moment i mean you can um we you know if we look at it in light of today, um, the idea that a convicted felon or a school child or anybody can have free and easy access to a weapon of this kind, automatic, semi-automatic, I don't care, is, is surely not what they intended or wanted. Well, back in those days, too, that was the only restriction that, that the law would recognize, that you could disarm a felon. And, uh, of course, a felon could then arm himself again back in those days. He'd be in violation of the law, just as this fellow was in violation of the law. But uh, tells you what? That uh, anti-gun laws are useless. Well, but it also tells you that in our gun... Well, you, you don't like the term gun worshipping. In our gun-loving culture, um, he's easy, he was very... It was very easy for him to get one. Well, okay, it's Just always easy, easy for the high school kids in my small town to get one. Candy, candy, to. it is very easy for a criminal, a felon, to get a firearm. There has never been a situation uh, in this country where a felon who did not want a firearm could not acquire one. And the way they usually acquire them is to steal them. Right. Right. But by any, the, the fact is that they are so accessible that they're there to be stolen. Well, that's They're true. They're all it, over the place. Well, so you could say the same of diamonds. Well, Art. that's right. But They're but, all over the but place, But clearly too. they don't have the same impact. They, uh, well, that's true. The diamond doesn't have the same impact. However, there's all kinds of tools and things like that with which one can uh, kill someone else if one is so disposed. Right, but this is, this is an, uh, a, mich a technology that is explicitly designed for the purpose of inflicting harm. 
Well, what about crossbows and, and hunting bows? It, okay, but they're not available on any street corner to any school child. Well, they'd be surprised. It, uh, you can get you can get a, a bow and arrow from any sporting goods store. There's absolutely no controls on it whatsoever, nor should there be. Matter of fact, let me let me tell you something about uh, a hunting bow and arrow. Now, t let, let, let me just see if how much you know about these things. If I, I were know to very little about well, them, actually, let, let me let me suggest something to you. Yes, I am going to take a pane of window glass, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put it behind a sand bag. Right. And now I'm going to go off just six feet away from the sandbag with a three fifty seven Magnum pistol, right? One of the most powerful handguns right. in the world. And I'm going to shoot at the sandbag. What's going to happen to the pane of glass? Uh, I don't know. I would guess it would break from the vibration. No. No. Mm -hmm. What? Nothing. Nothing. The uh, sandbag will stop that three fifty seven Magnum bullet. Well, now what, I'm how going is to... this relevant to this discussion? Well, let me, let me suggest to you. I am now going to go back 6, 12 feet, whatever you want, with a 50, 55 pound hunting bow with a broad bladed hunting arrow, and I am going to launch that. Mm -hmm. And what do you think happens to the plane of glass? I don't know. The arrow will slice right through the sandbag and smash the glass. So you're saying we should control the sale of bow and arrows? No, what I'm, saying, what I'm saying is that you are doing things backwards. What you are upset about is human responsible agency. An well, individual yeah. did something bad. And you propose, uh, in order that out of 260 some odd million people, that there not be the possibility that any one of them can do something bad, to remove from society uh, any object with which any one of them could perform an evil act. Now, that's kind of silly. No, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, well, let, let's go through the other points I made, if, if All right. we can. Okay, well, we, I think we discussed that one. Um, the second point was that you preach and spread contempt for Bill Clinton and the desire to see him out of office. True or not true? Um, yes, except uh, I would point out that I would not be able to do that had not Bill Clinton, by his actions, made himself reasonably worthy of contempt. In your opinion? Yes, in my opinion, but if it were only my opinion, if, for example, I were saying... Bill Clinton is contemptible because he keeps a cat named Socks. I would be laughed off the radio, wouldn't I? Probably. Okay. So, uh, yeah, but you... What I say is it's because he proved a coward in time of war, went off to a foreign country, demonstrated against the people who did put on their country's uniform and were dying face down in the mud at the very time that he was going to Moscow, is the capital. Is this your of main... Uh... No, no, no. My other, my other thing are... Uh, that uh, he and his uh, wife, whom he has gratuitously interjected into this uh, by giving her uh, genuine um, uh, power, authority, and what have you, mm -hmm. to which she is not legally entitled, uh, which she has and abused. And he's the only president to ever have done that with anybody in his, in his circle, right? Well, uh, when John Fitzgerald Kennedy did that with his brother, we passed a law making it illegal. Did you know that? Okay, go ahead. Continue what you're doing. All right. Saying. So, in any event, uh, the the money grubbing, the uh, the excoriating uh, of others uh, who have uh, earned money when his wife was practicing uh, the magic of turning a thousand dollars into a hundred thousand right. dollars with the aid of the chief lobbyist for someone uh, whose industry was being uh, run uh, under the aegis of her husband, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things. What about uh, the, the money that that Reagan turned over with the help of the Hollywood film industry for his campaign? How is that any different? You mean the the uh, the contributions? I'm not talking about contributions. I'm talking about ways of of turning small amounts of money into large amounts of money via people in industry who are your friends. Well, tell, tell me are what, they the first tell me, person tell, who ever did this? Well, the, fir the first person uh, to the. Uh, knowledge of the entire press corps because they have uh, failed to find any other instance of it of what uh, hillary clinton did i don't know what you're referring to with respect to ronald reagan i know he got plenty of contributions from the uh, uh, film industry but then of course so does bill clinton and that's not the cause of uh of my objection let me hear something this thing about the the military i've heard you say this many times i don't get to listen to your show all the time but i i listen when i can mm -hmm. and 
you know, the, the sampling of snippets that I hear, this is a recurring theme, this thing about the military. Mm-hmm. And you speak as though he is the only American of any age or generation who opposed the Vietnam War. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the fact that he opposed the Vietnam War. There were people uh, who uh, put I mean, on I their country's uniform and went over there and fought even though they opposed the war. But he didn't. And he is the only person who proved a coward in time of war is he- who is now uh, purports to be the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Now, he legally is. I would, I would always support the proposition that he has the legal authority to send uh, United States troops into harm's way, but I would suggest to you that he specifically lacks the moral authority. Frankly, I, I, the, the fact that he is a commander-in-chief who, who doesn't like war, I think, is actually a, an asset. In it's that not position. that he doesn't like war. It's that he expressed in writing his loathing for the military, the very people he purports to command. I tell you what, I'm really enjoying this. Can you hold on? I would we have to. We have to go to uh, some crass commercial messages. Sure. When we come back, we will, because I think we're only probably about halfway through uh, your uh, various objections to okay. me. The G. Gordon Liddy Show, Radio Free D.C. And we are back here at Radio Free D.C., the G. Gordon Liddy Show. Continuing now with my conversation with Candy from Rochester, New Hampshire. Hello? Yeah, hello, um, Candy. Hi, you there? I am here. Okay. Um, I think we were we were talking about the second point about the um, your contempt for Bill Clinton. Yes. And you're um, basing this um, not only but seemingly primarily on his um, cowardly draft on. No, no, there's no, you know, we were, we were unfortunately forced to go uh, off the air for commercials. Uh, I would say the, the other bit of, of uh, contempt is because he lied about himself, his program and everything else when he sold himself to a mere 43% of the electorate. Uh, he said he was a new Democrat, he was a centrist, he was going to have a middle class tax cut and so on. And as uh, one person has put it, not originally with me, the reason the voters are contemptuous of him, angry with him, is that uh, he said, I am selling you a new tire, and the voters found that it was flat. How do you uh, address the fact that he has done more in the time that he's been in office and has shown more initiative and put things on the agenda that desperately needed to be on the agenda and has been more active than any president in a very long time. You say that when you say when, well, you see you you, you praise it. Well, wait a minute now. It, you, it is illogical to say that someone should be praised for being more active and doing more, unless one can also say that which was done and the activity resulted in good rather well, than think, harm. Well, that think, is not true. I think. Well, this may be a, just a fundamental difference in philosophy, but I. I think that in many cases, in many, uh, on many issues, that is the case. Well, I've agreed with him and do agree with him on NAFTA and on GATT. Uh, and what about Haiti? On Haiti, absolutely not. We've got no business being in Haiti. Okay. You know, I think the thing that, I think part of your, your contempt for, for Clinton is that you don't understand him. I mean, we've talked, I think we, like, when I... Don't understand him? Yeah, I think that you, do, you basically don't get it. You know, he, um, and in fact, in the person you were talking to before I got on, you were talking, you said something about the, uh, something about his generation, or something, I can't remember. Oh, about the baby boomers are now sort of in positions of power or something you were alluding to. Mm-hmm. And I, you're absolutely right about that. And I, and I think that this is part of um, what you and many others don't see about him is that he he's a he's fundamentally different in many ways well yes he is fundamentally different i mean but not even fundamentally different from the baby boomers the 60s generation is unjustly criticized uh, i would suspect by members of my generation as being the generation that refused to fight for his country when fully 50 percent as a matter of fact at least actually did put on its country's uniform and go and fight for its country in, in the 1960s. They were the 60s generation also. Oh. And what is to not understand about a man who in writing said he loathed the military and in writing said that he was not going to go and fight because he wanted to protect himself from physical harm? That is the classical definition of a coward. 
Well, you know, he, he opposed the war morally, and he didn't go and kill people and do something he didn't believe in. People Tanina, who oppose Tanina, the war morally and who don't want to kill people can go and into battle carrying a stretcher instead of a gun and have to ex uh, expose themselves to the same kind of fire. He wouldn't do that because, Candy, he's a coward. And now, uh, let's go to Leesburg, Virginia, and talk to another Tom. Tom? Hi, Mr. Liddy. How are you doing this I'm afternoon? I'm doing splendidly so far, but who knows? I could. I got hit by an 18-wheeler this this morning. I could be hit by a bus fatally this afternoon. You never know. Well, that's no good. I hope that doesn't happen to you. Well, so do I. Well, um, I am a uh, very, very liberal individual, and um, please excuse any noise you may hear. I'm a professional bicycle mechanic. I'm very young, as I'm sure you can tell by my voice. I'm 19 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to call. I've been a listener to your show for about a year now. And I just wanted to call and discuss some of your it, some issues that you cover very, very frequently okay. on your show. Um, first of all, I kind of don't understand why you hate Mr. Clinton so much. Um, I personally think he's a good man. I really do think that at least he's trying something. You know, I, I, my impression of Mr. and Mrs. Clinton is that they do care about the American people and that they really do want to do something for them. Um, with health care and schools and everything else and the environment which is something very very uh dear to me because i am a mountain biker and uh more and more especially in northern virginia here there's no place to go mountain biking <laughs> so kind of makes it hard for me well let's let's um treat those things that you've raised and, and they're certainly sensible things to raise as uh, seriatim uh, you know one at a time now first of all i do not hate uh, the Clintons you, to to uh, have so intense a feeling as hatred would require for me you know a pretty enormous stimulus somebody would have to uh, harm my family or something of that sort deliberately and everything and I don't hate I do however uh, have uh, contempt for both of them now the, the reason that I have contempt for him is because when it was his turn to put on his country's uniform as down through the entire history of this country, from time to time, it has been necessary in wartime uh, for people to don the uniform and to go in harm's way or to be subject to being sent in harm's way. Uh, he refused to do so. He expressed, uh, moreover, in writing, his loathing for those who did. That That's really, I think, e egregious. And he said that the reason he was uh, avoiding service was to preserve himself from physical harm and he said that in writing too now that's the classical definition of a coward and I, I have contempt for cowards uh, for Mrs. Clinton uh, w what I guess really galls me so much is the arrogance and the hypocrisy that I find there now let me tell you why I say that uh, this is a woman who uh, criticized the 1980s and, and anybody who uh, made any money in the 1980s is the decade of greed and what have you when we now know that in the 1970s uh, she was piling it up hand over fist this is a woman who drove down through her speeches the price of pharmaceutical stocks while her trust fund was selling them short thus earning money on what she was doing this is a woman who uh, took the advice of uh, the chief lawyer lobbyist for an industry seeking favors, which received favors from her husband when he was governor, uh, which advice enabled her to, while well, at least bending, if not breaking the rules of commodities trades, to turn a thousand dollars into a quick hundred thousand dollars, and then all the lying about it, the, the talking about, well, I stopped it when I got pregnant and everything, when, and then when she gets caught, she always has to backtrack and and uh, the truth is sort of extracted from her. A woman who's uh, wanted to do us a lot of good with the uh, with her concept of health care and I recognize that people can be for the country and wanting to do uh, things and have a different approach concerning which reasonable people can and do differ but she chose to do hers in secret and uh, she and her chief aide in that enterprise Mr. Ira Magaziner chose to lie about it they said look we've only got 500 people here they are all government employees therefore 
uh, they are entitled to do this in secret, and we're only spending $100,000. All the while, there's uh, in excess of 1,000 of them. 378 of them are not government employees, and they're spending literally in the millions. And then when a court forces them to uh, turn over the papers, they purge the papers and all the rest of it, uh, you know, I've just had enough of that. So that, that's the reason that I have my feelings uh, that I do for the Clintons. Uh, now, as to them uh, doing good, uh, I will give them credit for wanting to do good, uh, but if someone uh, tells you, look, I, I want to do you good, and in your opinion, that which that person wants to do will do you harm, uh, then I think it is legitimate for you to oppose it, even though you give... Uh, uh, credit to that person for wanting to do the right thing. Uh, if, uh, th for example, uh, oh, let's, let's take a, a, a medical thing or something of that sort, and someone comes to you and says, look, I've been reading in a medical book, I know you're not feeling well, and uh, if we bleed you, you'll, you'll get better. And, uh, you know, uh, that person genuinely wants to help you. The problem is they're reading in a medical book uh, from another century. And, uh, you know, that's what happened to George Washington. He, he caught, a, uh, I think, a cold or something, and they bled him until he bled to death. Well, those persons are well-meaning, but they're very dangerous to have around you. And the nostrums, you know, the socialist nostrums uh, of the uh, Clintons and the people who think like them are dangerous for their country. They are well-intentioned, but they do a lot of damage. And so uh, I oppose them. Okay, well, sir. Well, um, another point, another thing that you always you seem to bring up quite a bit is uh, public schools, mm -hmm. and something this really, really um, affects me. My mother is a public school teacher. I personally think she's one of the greatest women ever to walk the face of the earth. Well, my wife, for about um, 15 years, taught in, in public schools, and I better think she's uh, one of the greatest women to ever uh, walk the face of the earth, or I'll be shot when I get home. <laughs> okay, well, um, I... I don't really have a problem with the public schools. Another thing you also bring up about schooling is um, funding for um, Catholic, Christian, uh, and uh, other religious type schools. This is something that I have to disagree with because personally I am very, very against organized religion um, as, as far as my personal uh, um, well, excuse, personal okay. involvement in I understand I that. do believe in God and all that, but I've just found so many churches they're they're just such scams it's not even funny okay and well let's, religion let's, has been used throughout the ages just to play on man's fear of death well let's um, let's, ex let's, ex let's examine the the uh, know, four or five things that you've just brought up uh, uh, this time now first of all uh, public schools and 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 teachers the the problems in the public schools are only partially with some teachers and uh let's see if you're 19 uh, I would say that your mom uh, is a mature woman. She's 51. Okay, uh, she's 51, and, and Mrs. A little bit late in life. But. Okay, well, Mrs. Liddy is in her 60s. Now, the the people who uh, learned to be teachers, who are your mother's age, are are not the problem, because this whole outcome-based education fraud uh, had not been foisted upon the teaching colleges and the rest of it. When, when Mrs. Liddy went through and when your mother went through. Uh, they are capable of doing a superb job. The problems that they have, often, uh, is that the administrators come to them with a whole new deal called outcome-based education, and uh, they are no longer permitted to send, uh, for example, to the parents of their ch uh, school children that they're teaching a report card that accurately reflects the performance of that child, either in a letter grade or in a number grade. They are required to simply say uh, developing or not yet or something of that sort. So the parent doesn't know whether the child is performing in, say, English at uh, a uh, rate of 94 or a rate of 44. Now, I think that... Uh, Although you're 19 and you, you you sound as if you're probably not married and not having any children. No, I do not. Okay, but uh, let me ask you this: at at an appropriate time, I think you probably 
believe you will marry, don't you think? Oh, eventually, yeah. Okay. And you will have children, I think, in the normal course of events. Eventually, yes. Now, would you not want to know whether one of those children was performing at a, at a, a, a very uh, highly effective rate or at a very uh, a poor rate? Wouldn't you want to know that? Yes, I would. Um, I did okay. participate in outcome-based education for one year. My, due to my parents' divorce, I kind of bounced around a lot when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and one year while living with my father in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, we did have what seems to me was some type of outcome-based education, as you explain it. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, um, there were four different grades, per se. It was, uh, one was excellent, one was good and um, satisfactory, and uh, one started with an I, I can't, inefficient or not. Incomplete. In it, well, I don't, I don't believe it was incomplete, because okay. there was, a, it, it, Kinda, it didn't reflect a failing grade. It reflected. Okay. Well, I would say that what, any of my yeah, you're, you're describing a partial one, or just sort of on the way to one. But right. the, the 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 problem that is right now is that the American schools, um, by all these tests that they're giving them, that they, they they are producing people who are performing less and less and less well in the various academic disciplines. Now that means that the school systems are failing. Now, it, it, there's, that, that gives us two things we need to do. First of all, we need to turn that around. But for those children who are in the system now, uh, by the time the whole thing can be turned around, it's too late for them. Therefore, I advocate doing what I did with my children, which is pull them out of the public school system, pay the extra money to put them into private schools, and save them. Right. At the same time, uh, you know, you, you do your best to uh, try to get the public schools to uh, be able to effectively educate once again. Now, given that the problems with public education are nearly universal, they're, they're not, but they're nearly, they're, they're getting more and more, uh, it seems to me that it is reasonable to use a proven method of increasing the quality of any uh, series of organizations, and that is competition. Uh, if you have vouchers which can be applied by parents to sending their children to public schools or private schools, whether those private schools are religiously oriented or not, then I would suggest to you that the normal course of competition will be that the good schools will prosper, the poor schools will either change their ways or they will die. And if they're not doing the job, they should die. I, I do understand that. And okay. um, part of my problem is as though that being that I do kind of disagree with organized religion, I pay taxes and I pay quite a bit. And <laughs> sometimes I so feel do like all. maybe I, I don't want to pay as much as I do, but I do realize that a uh, country does need money, and it is my civic responsibility to pay the taxes since I do reside in this country. Mm -hmm. um, my problem is is that in the Constitution it does say that the government and religion pretty much do not have anything to do with each other, and they no, should not have say, anything to do with that, each that, other. That isn't what the Constitution says. Do you know what the Constitution says? Um, exactly what? I it says there shall be no establishment of religion. Now, l l let me explain to you what they're talking about there. Back before we had formed the United States of America, we had, you know, the original colonies, the 13 colonies. Right. I, In those days, they did have established religions in uh, some of the colonies, just as they did back in England. In England, the established religion is the Church of England, the, the Anglican right. Communion. And uh, depending upon when you came over here, uh, which uh, formal organized religion uh, you adhered to, you would either be welcomed with open arms in a particular colony or literally whipped across the border into another colony because they didn't want you. Now, when we formed this country, we said, you know, no, we don't want any more of that. Look, we all believe in God because you, find, you find references to God all through the, uh, uh, the, you know, the Constitution and the writings of the Founding Fathers and what have you, but we do not want to have any established religion. In other words, we, we do not want the legislature of New Jersey, for example, saying that the Methodist uh, religion is the established religion of the state of New Jersey. That's 
what they were talking about, and that's what they forbade. They did not say uh, that um, you should have no reference to uh, a crash at Christmas time on public land or uh, a, 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 a seven candle candlestick or something like that with a cross of David on public land at a time of something like that. They, they, they had that, and uh, nobody objected to it. Now you have a, you have a problem with uh, well, the the actions of various of various uh, formal institutionalized religion. Now, what religion means is man's relationship to God. Now, you can have a relationship to God without subscribing to any particular formal religion, can't Which you? Which I do. Yeah, I mean, of yeah. course you can. And that, 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 there's, there's no problem with that, and there's nothing in the in the law that says otherwise. The uh, the, the various institutions, formal organized religions, are groups of human beings, aren't they? Yes, they, they are. Can, they can make mistakes, big, bad mistakes. Let's take the, the one I grew up in, the Roman Catholic Church. They're the ones who ran the Inquisition. They would take somebody who was a Jew and, uh, you know, put red-hot irons on him and things like that until he set suddenly uh, converted to Roman Catholicism. Well... Uh, That's not you know, exactly right. No, and, and it also, I would uh, suggest to you, is not much of a valid conversion. You know, you can make people do just about anything you want to if you torture them. All right, so these, these were people who did bad things, and they did them in the name of God and religion and the rest of it. Now, kind of, par kind of yeah. a bit of a paradox there. Well, it, what it means is that, that they were human beings, and, they, and they're, they have free will, and they can do bad things, for, for even for good reasons. Remember what I was talking about? Uh, Bill Clinton may be doing bad things for good reasons. Well, people who are involved in organized religion sometimes can do bad things for good reasons. This is not a, a reason that the organization cannot be changed. The Catholic Church no longer runs uh, inquisitions, believe me. The, now, the Catholic Church, uh, in my view, does some things that I disagree with. The, uh, the, there's various different uh, organized religions that do things with which I disagree. I can, uh, I can be a part of an organized religion, should I choose to do that, and fight from within to reform, or I can just say, look, I, I don't want to be a part of that. But that doesn't mean that I have to uh, look down upon those persons who are in organized religions and who are doing their very best to make those particular bodies of human beings organized around a common purpose uh, better. Right. Well, basically, my, my point was is that I, I work very, very hard for my money, and I don't want a single penny of that going to especially the Catholic Church, which I, I find very, very offensive. Um, and that's what would happen with your proposed voucher system. Well, now, would it really? Because here's, here's the situation. The, a Catholic Church's school would be uh, eligible to receive tuition from some person who wants to go to that particular school. And uh, I don't, don't know if you're aware of it or not, but uh, especially in urban areas, and especially in a lot of ur uh, urban areas with a lot of black people, there's an awful lot of non-Catholic children going to the Catholic schools because their parents, many of them black, perceive the education they receive there to be superior to that available to them in the public school system. I don't consider that to be sending money to the Catholic Church. It's running the school. It's really not running the church. Well, um, it, if you could tell me, I may be wrong, but if you go to a Catholic school, which I did, we had little Montessori school type preschools mm -hmm. I went to when I was a child, they did push their beliefs on you. And, you know, if so. Oh, when I went to Catholic schools, they, they pushed their beliefs on me, too. I mean, <laughs> yeah. big time, you know, with the ruler. Yeah, with and the ruler across the knuckles. Sure, but, the, uh, the, you know, it didn't really do them all that much good because, as Mrs. Liddy will tell you, I'm not much of a Roman Catholic. <laughs> I mean, I identify myself that way um, for want of anything else. It's more cultural than anything else. But that's, uh, again, th those kinds of tactics don't work. And uh, I think you'll find that w when you've got persons who are identified in the school as non Catholic, and when they register, they tell them, are you a Catholic or a non-Catholic? They don't go to the religious classes. They don't even take the religious classes that you and I took. Uh, and the, the, the faith is not pressed upon these people. That's not why they're there. They're there simply to get an education.
and the people there understand it who are running it. Well, unfortunately, I'm told that I have to understand that it is absolutely necessary that I take a commercial break. I've run way long with you because I, I thought you raised some very good questions. Uh, you're a very intelligent person. Thank you. And uh, uh, I hope that you found uh, the conversation as um, uh, enjoyable as I have. I did, sir. Thank you very, very much, Tom. All right. Well, thank you for your time. You bet, sir. Okay. Okay. Goodbye. All right, ladies and gentlemen. It uh, looks like we're down to the last few seconds. Uh, let's see. Here's, here's a uh, fact by uh, Pat Darcy, who is uh, from uh, Overland Park in uh, Kansas. He says, the liberal media struck again back in the 70s before he lost his mind to drugs. Liberal literary hero Hunter S. Thompson erected at his home a scarecrow wearing a President Nixon mask. He used this scarecrow to teach his Dobermans how to attack male genitalia. As I recall, he also occasionally used the scarecrow for target practice. The liberals treated his behavior as a comic manifestation of the McGovernite's crisp intelligence and apparently saw nothing wrong with his symbolic gesture. I can see nothing to distinguish Hunter S. Thompson's acts with those of your own, with the possible exception of the fact that your targets ended up with a few holes in them. Sincerely, Pat Dorsey. Way to go, Pat. Thank you very, very much. And ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this hour of the G. Gordon Eddy Show. G. Gordon, I'm always...